Welcome to This Week in Heresy, Episode 64, Tradition, Secrecy, and the Life of a Public Witch, with our guest via Skype, Storm Fairywolf. Hey Storm, welcome to This Week in Heresy. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. So for the benefit of those who don't know who you are, um, although I'm sure a good proportion of my audience does know who you are, um, could you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about who you are and what you do? Um, Sure. I am a professional warlock, and I use that term very specifically. Um, I have been practicing witchcraft for over 30 years now, so now I feel old. Mm. (laughs) Um, And I do it professionally. I own a shop in the San Francisco East Bay area um, called The Mystic Dream. And I offer classes and readings and all that sort of stuff. And I actually have a book coming out in about a year with Llewellyn on the fairy tradition of witchcraft. So what is the fairy tradition? Sort of depends on who you talk to. (laughs) But um, the fairy tradition is a path of um, American traditional witchcraft. Um, It is a lineage-based tradition, which means that um, we um, pass our tradition down in an initiatory line that stems back to um, a gentleman by the name of Victor Anderson, um, who passed away in 2001. Um, And primarily, it is a tradition that is ecstatic based as opposed to something like Wicca, which you might argue is fertility based. Um, So we are a tradition that is much more concerned with um, altered states of awareness, trance, um, shamanic type experiences are at the core uh, uh, of our tradition. Um, And it's also a tradition that is based in art, poetry and creativity. So what led you into fairy witchcraft and, you know, kind of like what led you to where you are now? Well, I've always been interested in witchcraft specifically. Um, And when I say always, I remember when I was two years old telling my mother that I was going to grow up and be a witch. Now, I will admit that that probably had more to do with reruns of Bewitched than... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> anything else at the time, but it, it was, right, very, right. It, it was just, it's, it, it spoke to something in me and just over the years, you know, kind of getting a hold of, um, I remember the time life books on the occult and reading right. about witches and ghosts and just all the supernatural stuff just really fascinated me. But there was something really specific about witchcraft, you know, I, cause I would read other things, ceremonial magic and this, that, and the other, and it just didn't speak to me in the same level. There was something about witchcraft. Um, finding fairy tradition, um, probably when I was 19, I guess I found, um, the spiral dance by Starhawk Mm -hmm. and she talked about fairy tradition and Victor Anderson and the old, um, Pictish people. And, you know, and there was something in there that just really spoke to me. And especially when she mentioned the blue God who really is, um, a central figure in fairy tradition, witchcraft, there was just something in me that clicked and I just knew this is what I needed to do. And at that time it was very difficult actually to find anyone who was practicing, let alone teaching fairy tradition. Um, you know, on the surface it was very secretive. Um, when I found someone eventually who was teaching, um, it was actually a very public thing, you know? So it was kind of, um, it was kind of interesting to me that, that my um, experience up until that point had been not finding anybody. It's very secretive and people would whisper about it in hushed tones. But then here you now suddenly there's someone teaching a class for pay to a large group of people. There's probably like 30 or 40 people in that first class that I took. This would have been back in 92. Um, and then that was kind of, at least in the Bay Area, which is really kind of the mecca of fairy tradition. Um, that was kind of becoming part of the culture, larger for pay classes. Now at that time, I didn't realize that that was a controversy unto itself. Right, you, know, right. um, you know, it was only years later that I would find that people didn't like that that was happening, you know, because there's uh, probably a goodly number of people in fairy that are very much of the mindset that um, you should not charge, you know, for classes in any form. Um, or that you should not even talk about these things publicly. 
Mm-hmm. And I will say that, you know, in my training, there were some things that were considered secret. There are things that I took an oath to keep certain things secret. Um, but that's very little, you know, in comparison to what some other lines, you know, of fairy, yeah. you know, considered to be secret. That's one of the, I think, strengths and weaknesses, both of fairy tradition is that we are so incredibly diverse. Every line kind of has its own rules, you know, as, as to how to conduct ourselves publicly, even privately. And I feel that I was fairly fortunate in the sense that the lineage that I was trained and initiated into um, did not consider fairy to be all that secret. You know, there were certain things, obviously, that were, um, but for the most part, no. And then later, I would speak with um, Cora Anderson, one of the founders, and um, she told me that there were very few things in fairy that were secret. So this kind of flew in the face of some of the the emergent culture, you know, of fairy at the time. So we definitely kind of have, I would say, kind of a, um, our own version of the culture wars, mm-hmm. you know, going on in fairy. But I think ultimately this is a good thing because it really kind of keeps us all on our toes and we all have to really understand where we're coming from and we have to question our own motives. You know, where, mm-hmm. why do I do the things that I do? You know, why am I public about, you know, certain things when other people would rather that I'm not? Um, well, it's not certain, certainly not because I just want to put all the secrets out there. I've certainly been told that about myself. Um, I always <laughs> find it very enlightening when people tell you what your own motivations are. Right. Um, or write about your own motivations on some other website. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, that's kind of fun. I, fi- I find that sometimes like I'll every once in a while, I don't do it so much anymore because it, I found it to be kind of hurtful and a waste of time, but I would Google myself to see what people were saying. And I found some horrendous horrendous things. You know, I learned mm-hmm. I was an attempted murderer. That was fun. Oh uh, my. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, oh, that's very interesting. Already then. <laughs> but, um, you know, I don't know, but, um, what the conclusion I came to is I've always been, I've always had this draw to be public about my craft. And in fact, just recently, um, a few months ago, I had the honor of meeting Lori Cabot for the first time. And I will say she was a very influential figure in my coming to the craft. When I was a little boy, she was running for mayor of Salem. And so Mm -hmm. she was on this news program and they were interviewing her. And of course it's all kind of sensational. She's in her black robes and everything because that's who she is. You know, this is a commitment that she made to the goddess to be a public witch 24 seven. Um, but, um, it really showed me that, Hey, This is a possibility. People can be public about their craft. And then as a political statement, I decided that I was also going to be public about my craft, primarily because I knew that so many people couldn't be. Mm -hmm. And I felt that visibility was so important. You know, I'm also a gay man, you know, and I grew up in, you know, the 70s and 80s, you know, so we're talking about the height of the AIDS crisis. And one of the things that really um, has stuck with me is... um, the um, tagline of act up, which was Mm -hmm. silence equals death. Right. And so, and I really, as a gay man, I really took that to heart that, you know, silence, I have to speak up about who I am. I have to be visible about who I am. That doesn't mean I think that everybody needs to, that doesn't mean that it's a judgment. I think, Oh, everybody needs to go out there and be public about their gayness or about their witchness, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But I do think that those of us who are, inspired to do so or drawn to do so, I think it's important that we do so because in the lack of that, you know, if we don't have that out there, you know, being visible, um, people forget and then people can just easily superimpose their own um, ideas onto who we are. And, um, and that's where things get really scary. And we're kind of watching that happen to some degree now with the political climate in the United States becoming mm-hmm. so Islamophobic, you know, and so I'm really happy to see more Muslim people speaking up and saying, Hey, no, this is who we are. And I feel like they shouldn't have to do that. But Mm -hmm. that's kind of the default is if we're not visible about all of our non mainstreamness, you know, uh, then it becomes very dangerous where we're allowing an environment to fester in which eventually, you know, violence can happen. You know, right. luckily we live in an, in, a, in an era now, at least most of us, depending on where we live, where there really isn't 
that much of a concern of violence against pagans or witches, at least where I live. You know, I live in the San Francisco yeah. area. There's obviously other places in the country that that's, it's not as safe, you know, to mm-hmm. be at. You know, so I think it makes it even more important for those of us who do live in a safer area to speak out and to be public and to just remind people, no, we're here and we're people mm-hmm. and we're not going away. Well, you know, it was um, what we were talking before um, we started recording, you know, about, you know, I'm very public about being both Wiccan and Christian. And I, and I, and I agree, you know, you need to have that. I, there's a few things about being very public that I think, and when I totally agree with you about, you know, being very open and, you know, making it for lack of a better term, more normalized, <laughs> you know, like, oh yes, there, there are pagans that do exist. Oh yes, there are multi-faith people that do exist, but also being an example for the people that also believe that way. So like, you right. know, you're being an example of a warlock, a witch that is very public and, oh yes, this is possible. You know, me being a wicked Christian. Oh yes, this is possible. Exactly. And I, I want to say, I think that's so important specifically where you're coming from. I think that's so important because it's almost like you've got two worlds. Obviously, you you occupy two worlds, but the inhabitants or some of the inhabitants of both of those worlds could easily turn on you. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've seen that, you know, uh, I remember there, who was it? I think it was Sam Webster had Mm -hmm. written something and basically was saying he couldn't be pagan and Christian. And, you know, I've met him since then and he seems like a delightful fellow, but I really take exception to that because, you know, and, and first of all, I... I, on record, I do not identify as Christian. You know, I, I was, when I grew up, as probably almost everybody you know, in right, the United right, States, right. you know, yeah, yeah. kind of grew up with that. Um, but I, I, I never understood why people have such a need to define other people. Mm. You know, my, my philosophy is like, you know, you come to me and you tell me, oh, yeah, I'm a pagan and a Christian. And so my job is to believe you. Yeah. You know, my job yeah, is to exactly. support you. You know, it's none of my business. I don't know why people would be offended, you know, by that. And they get this idea like, oh, you, well, it's simply impossible or it's like sleeping with the enemy or blah, blah. You know, oh, we need to yeah. get rid of this mentality because the, the, the thing is, there's no such thing as us versus them. There's mm-hmm. only us. Yeah. We are all yeah. people on this planet. It doesn't matter what color we are, our sexual orientation, our gender identity our religion, it doesn't matter. We all are on this planet and we need to figure out a way to work together. And all of these other little arguments, it just detracts from that, in my opinion. Yeah. And I, I agree. I mean, especially like I, I read that post from Sam Webster and I was just kind of like, oh, and you know, at the time I was kind of going through some other stuff. So I'm just like, I'm just not, I just don't have the space <laughs> to go there right now. But you know, it, <sighs> It really gets down, like you're saying, it really kind of gets down to the fundamental thing. It's like, who are we to say that somebody's not who they say they are? Right. You know, it, 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 and you see this regardless of tradition. You know, you've got Christians saying you can't be a proper Christian if you don't believe X, Y, and Z. You've got witches saying, oh, you can't be a proper witch if you don't believe X, Y, and Z. And, you know, and I've even seen other fundamentalist attitudes in other traditions, even Buddhism for crying out loud. It's like, oh gosh, please I people. <laughs> I know the really? Buddhism thing is the one that really, I will say, really shocked me the most. Free. You know, when I hear, what was it, like in the 90s, there were like the the Buddhist terrorists like setting off nerve gas like in the subway. I, I mean, I'm like, Free. what? You know, you just have this idea of like, oh, the Buddhists, they're all just trying to make everyone enlightened. You know, mm. and it just really shows you no matter what the philosophy, it could be a really great philosophy. It could be a really great religion at its core. Someone is going to come in and screw it all up. Uh, word, <laughs> word. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, even fairy traditions that has has it has had its issues, and I know, I don't know if you want to yes. ha- rehash a lot of that, but you know, there even a few years ago there was a big thing in the fairy tradition and a big rar and grr and and that split a lot of people, and it's just kind of like really people, <laughs> really. Yeah, I- yeah, I don't even know what really I could say about it because every every time I open my mouth about it, someone gets offended, and and I, you know, and that's pretty much true of any time you're going to speak about fairy. And of course, mm-hmm. assuming when my book comes out, that's going to be another, you know, <laughs> yeah. log on that fire. But right, you know, but um, like with the whole thing, like the fairy split, 
I didn't really see it the same way, but of course I'm biased. I, I will mm-hmm. say I'm biased. You know, I'm, I'm definitely on one side of the camp. Um, but my whole philosophy within fairy and within life has pretty much be, it's pretty much been live and let live, you know, and I, I, I've tried my best and, you know, sometimes I think I've been successful and sometimes not, you know, at trying to show that, Hey, we are a diverse tradition and all of us are equally valid, mm-hmm. you know? And somehow I feel that that argument gets thrown by the wayside, you know, because I'm not um, bowing down, you know, to some voices that would prefer that, you know, I just totally silent. You know, I, I was hearing from some people, in the split camp, you know, um, mm-hmm. who were saying who were saying how outraged they were when Starhawks the Spiral Dance came out because the Iron Pentacle was supposed to be secret. I'm like, okay, well, sure, maybe it was supposed to be. I've never actually heard that from anybody credible. Yeah. But you know, maybe maybe it was supposed to be secret. However, the fact remains that it's helped a lot of people. You know, exactly. and to me, that's that trumps everything else. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. well, I don't care if you wanted this piece of liturgy to be secret. If I find that it's useful and actually helping people connect with spirit, then I'm going to use it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll give credit where credit is due. Oh, absolutely. You know, but, you know, I'm I'm not going to not use it simply because it makes somebody else uncomfortable. In fact, that was kind of an interesting thing for me in regards to fairy tradition as much of the training as it was presented to me was about examining our boundaries around comfort Mm -hmm. and in kind of realizing that magic doesn't happen in your comfort zone. We need to come right up against that edge and we need to at least step our toe over the edge. You know, Mm -hmm. we need to kind of push our boundaries and, and really examine why we have those certain boundaries. When I asked Cora about secrecy in fairy, she told me that much of the secrecy back in the day was practical you know, yeah. back in the 50s and even 60s, if you told people you were a witch, they were likely going to throw rocks through your windows. They could take your right. kids away. I'm sure there's still places in the United States where that still could happen. You hear little horror stories, you know, mm-hmm. whatever. But for the most part, that's no longer true. And one of the main reasons that that's no longer true is there have been a lot of people like Lori Cabot, like Starhawk, who have been very public about who they are. Mm-hmm. And it gives the public an opportunity to start actually learning something real and to eventually acclimate, you know, to that. So that's why I think it's really important for those of us who are inspired to be public, to be very public, Mm -hmm. to bow down. Yeah. And, you know, and at least in in my tradition, and I know a lot of people disagree with us as far as our, as my tradition is concerned, that we don't have secrets at all because we don't think they're necessary. I mean, a lot of the stuff that people consider secret, like, I think a good proportion of it. I mean, there's probably some small stuff that we, you know, we obviously don't know because it didn't make it to Google. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right. right. <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot of stuff that people consider secret. And that was even in my first coven because I had a very secretive first coven and that got ugly really, like, within years, you know. It was very secretive, very culty, and and I had to go through a lot of process, including a lawyer, to get out of it. <laughs> oh, wow, wow. wow. Yeah, and that's a whole another story. But, um, you know, because of that secrecy and because of that, you know, cultiness, it's like we decided consciously not to have secrets. Because, you know, like I said, a lot of the stuff we that is considered secret in a lot of traditions is all out there on Google now. You know, you could do a quick Google search and find these things. I mean, heck, you can even find Masonic rituals, you know, with a quick oh, Google yeah. search. Well, and all that made me really question, too, What's the purpose, right. you know, of secrecy? And um, you know, I find myself in an interesting place, and maybe the you know part of it is I'm a Pisces with a Gemini moon, you know, so I've got this whole dualistic thing. I'm on the fence, so oh, I could see both sides, you know, mm-hmm. of this argument to some degree. And the conclusion that I came to is that secrecy in the craft absolutely can be a powerful tool, um, but by default, it It's not necessarily so. It depends on what we do with it. What I came to the conclusion was, is that secrecy at its best is a personal devotion. Mm. And so this is something that in my line of fairy tradition, um, Blue Rose, I really put forward. I I state that straight up on the principles page of our website. You know, I state secrecy is a personal devotion. And we do not seek to 
um, basically define or curtail the behavior of others who may not mm-hmm. adhere to the same rules of secrecy, you know, that, that we do. Um, for example, there, there are things that I have pledged in fairy to keep secret that other people are very public about. Mm-hmm. And what do I do? Nothing. I don't tell them that they're doing it wrong, you know, because they're following their own bliss. You know, it has nothing to do with me, but I don't draw attention to it Mm -hmm. because if I was to draw attention to it, then I would be revealing my secret. Them revealing their secret has no bearing on my secrecy. Right. And, and so secrecy as a personal devotion, in my opinion, is really the only healthy way to approach secrecy in the craft. Because then it's, it's just my own practice. I'm just, you know, I'm keeping certain things secret, not because I'm trying to keep information from you, mm-hmm. you know, but because this is part of my spiritual practice. There's a few little things. Now, it's easier for me because it's only a few little things right. you know, in our line. In some lines, everything is considered secret. Mm-hmm. And I, I, ha- I will say my heart goes out to those people because what a struggle. That right. must be, especially in the, in the in an environment in which you can Google and you find, you know, my husband and I have a website, fairytrad.org, and, and we have a lot of stuff up there, you know, mm-hmm. for free information. Um, and some people are really upset ab- about that, you know, because, mm-hmm. oh, we shouldn't be talking about this in public at all. Well, if that's your thought, then I invite you to not talk about it in public. Yeah. You know, but, um, but I'm going to follow my bliss. This is exactly mm-hmm. what my God soul, you know, is, is directing me to do. I feel this is important work. So I'm going to keep on with that. Right. And it, I know for me, it kind of pokes like covens that keep most of their stuff secret. It kind of twigs that button because that, that was like my first coven and mm-hmm. that can breed very bad things. <laughs> it yeah. has the potential to be, breed very bad things. And it doesn't mean, I, I want to say, it doesn't mean that it absolutely will right. be very bad things. However, I think we've all seen it enough to know that not only is it a possibility, it becomes a high probability. Right. What, what I've seen is that in addition to certain things, maybe it's deity names or symbols or pieces of liturgy, those right. things are considered secret. That's fine. But then almost invariably, I start seeing a culture of secrecy being built around those things that include people's behavior. Right. And this is where we get into the really culty aspect of things. And I certainly came up against that in fairy tradition. Oh yes. Oh yes. There, there was a period, uh, he's since passed away, but there were, there was an elder in our tradition who was a sexual predator. Mm -hmm. And both my husband Chaz and I came out and publicly spoke out about him and it caused a huge uproar I as you remember. can imagine mm-hmm. in fairy community this is back what in 2003 mm-hmm. and um it, it was kind of horrible this was the first time that i ever found that i had an enemy mm-hmm. in life mm-hmm. and it wasn't just the person it was all the people around him that wanted to protect him and right you know, it was it was it was it was pretty bad um but part of the accusation leveled against me was, well, you're supposed to protect your brothers and sisters of the craft. And by you coming out against him, you're attacking him. And therefore, you're an oath breaker. And mm-hmm. therefore, you know, you, we don't consider you part of the tradition anymore. And there was a, a few people that really kind of took that hardline stance. And I was like, what? Wow. The hell? But my husband, you know, at the time, obviously was rightly upset. And um, I remember he mentioned something to a coworker, and you know, he worked at a health food store at the time, and mm. um, mentioned something to a coworker. And his coworker turned to him and said, "Dude, you're in a cult." <laughs> and it was like the breath of fresh air. It was like <laughs> exactly what we needed to hear at the time. It was like, "Wow, you're right. We've bought into this cult mindset." Mm-hmm. And but once we heard that from an outside source, it was like the glamour was broken and we saw yeah. it for what it was. And then it didn't have any power over us anymore. So there's these people, you know, the screaming memes are still, you know, posting blog posts and <laughs> right. whatever, how evil we are, whatever. But now it doesn't matter to us any anymore. B- back then it really hurt because we thought, oh, we're part of a spiritual community and we expect it a lot better especially from a tradition that really kind of marketed itself as the pagan elite. And I will tell you, they really did yeah. at the time. And, you know, it's a double-edged sword. I, I can certainly see where some of that in some places could even be deserved. You know, there's a lot, if 
depending on who you're talking to and working with in fairy, there's some people that really take it seriously and really do the work and are not concerned with attacking other people. And, yep, yep. Uh, but like any group of humans, you're going to find, you know, that vocal, very vocal minority, you know, that is purporting, purporting to speak for the entire group. And mm-hmm. they're going to, you know, they're going to talk you down. They're going to yep. tell you just how disrespectful you are. You're evil, mean and horrible. Ah. Yes. 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 I was called a black magician and I thought I just delighted <laughs> By the way, that that was, I was like, really? Oh my gosh! Thank you so much. Where do I accept this award? Right. Actually, when when people ask, like, are you a white witch or a black witch? I'm like, mm, what day is it? <laughs> <laughs> let me let, let me get back to you on that one. <laughs> yeah, now that was something too. I think in fairy that was kind of a draw um, for some people, and probably maybe added to the fire was that. Unlike things like Wicca, which normally have something like the 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 Law of Three, mm-hmm. the Wiccan read any harm none, do as thou wilt, mm-hmm. um, that doesn't exist in fairy tradition. And so, some people within fairy take that as um, kind of a I don't know, just a, just a free ticket to be a jerk. Really, I'm trying <laughs> to watch my language, but you know, yeah. just, just you know, to to be hurtful. Mm-hmm. Um, I, there was one fairy initiate um, back in the day who on her blog said that compassion had no place in fairy. What? And, um, yeah. Wow. And, um, and really it got me thinking, I was like, wow, if there was ever a time that I would say to somebody that they're doing fairy wrong, it would be in that, in that instance, because Cora herself said the purpose of this is to make us better people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've heard people say, well, fairy is not a self-help tradition. Well, I think I understand where they're coming from in terms of like pop psychology, kind of fluffy self-help, you know, stuff, whatever. However, if you're not doing this to help yourself become better and more powerful, then I think you're just wasting your time. Yeah. Any spiritual path. If you're not doing it to make yourself a more self-actualized and strong person, then what is the point? You know, that's the whole point of any religion or spiritual path is to connect us to the divine and to grow, and I would say to become more compassionate. Mm-hmm. Now, compassion, I think a lot of people don't understand what compassion is. Absolutely. You know, and I love a tip of the hat to Thorn Coyle, you know, who mm-hmm. sometimes uses the phrase, idiot's compassion. <laughs> you know, and this is, just, <laughs> mm-hmm. just, 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 just spill your drink. Um, yep. <laughs> now, the, the idea that, like, compassion is always, like, holding someone's hand and saying, oh, they're there, dear, it's going to be better. Sometimes that is compassion. You know, Mm -hmm. but often compassion is, you know what, stop feeling sorry for yourself, get your ass off the couch, go get a job, you know, take Mm -hmm. care of yourself, you know, it's tough love, you know? Yeah. Well, 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 like we're, we're fond of saying, you know, to our students, it's like, you know, compassion isn't always nice. Right. It's not, compassion isn't being nice. Compassion is doing the best thing for the people, for everybody involved. And sometimes that is, like you said, holding somebody's hand, you know, sometimes it's bringing food to people sometimes, but sometimes it's telling somebody about themselves. Like, um, you're, you're, um, something you said earlier sparked one of the things when we were rewriting our, um, initiations, um, we were rewriting the Alexandrian initiations, what we added to our oath was that we asked, we, we asked our students, are you prepared to defend your brothers and sisters of the craft, even from themselves? Mm. And, you know, because people do stupid, stupid human tricks. I mean, <laughs> you know, there could be a day where I'm, I'm just in a depressive episode or something and I'm just losing my flipping mind. Mm-hmm. And I would hope that, you know, my coven mates would be like, Dude, what are you doing? Yeah, absolutely. There's been times, you know, in, the, in that instance, you know, I mentioned back in 2003, you know, when I went public, you know, there I, I was dealing with so much negativity that there was a period where I was starting to take that on. Mm-hmm. And I had a couple friends of mine, you know, c- you know, come to me and say, hey, Storm, maybe you need to rein it in a little, you know, because you're in danger of, you know, like descending down to that level. You know, and I was because I was so filled with frustration and anger and rightly so, you know, Um, but that didn't that's not 
that doesn't make it okay, you know, to like descend down to that level. It's like, you're not going to, what do you actually want, you know, out of this situation? We want to heal the situation. Well, we're not going to heal that if we're all just, you know, slinging mud at each other. And let me tell you, I mean, I've, I've got as much of an ego as the next guy. And so seeing (laughs) stuff, you know, when people argue on the internet and I still, I I get wrapped up into like weird internet arguments and and I'm not as bad as I was before, (laughs) although you can still follow me and see every once in a while something triggers me and, you know, and I'll post things and I can be a little snarky, but, um, um, hopefully I'm better, you know, than I was before. Now I find myself saying, oh, I'm just too tired. Maybe it's also just being, you know, I'll be 45 soon. I'm in my middle age now, I'm just like, oh gosh, I just feel too old for this yeah. stuff. I think, I think that gets a point, <laughs> especially, I think especially after you've been practicing for a while and you get to a certain point. And I, I, I've, I've actually been writing this because I'm uh, writing about this a lot because I'm writing a book about ethics and things. <laughs> yeah. Interesting stuff. Right. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I, 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 I've been writing about how there's these stages and it's kind of reminiscent of some of the stages that people go through when they're newly converted in any tradition where mm-hmm. you've got that, you know, you've got that initial zealotry stage where everything's awesome and new and nothing can be wrong about your tradition and everything's perfect. Right. And then, you know, then there's this middle stage where you're kind of, you've incorporated your tradition into your identity and... Like you will fight to tooth and nail to defend your identity, even if you know in your heart that something's wrong or right. should be changed. And then there's a third stage where it's more of integration where you just kind of look around and be like, yeah, I'm such and such, but I'm not the be all and end all. And yeah, we've got some issues and, but you know, hey, we're doing all right. <laughs> right, 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 right. Absolutely. You know, I think, I think it's really important to be able to, um, question, you know, our, our own traditions, question our teachers. Um, and and I don't mean that in in terms of, you know, being disrespectful. I think there's a respectful way to question our teachers and to question what they're teaching us. I expect my students to question me, Mm -hmm. you know, um, I, I, I want them to think about what I am presenting to them. And I, I even want them to disagree, you know, mm-hmm. and that's for me, that's actually one of the powers of fairy is that it doesn't rely on belief. You know, it, it's not relying on strict adherence, you know, to any one particular philosophical mindset. You know, one of the, I, I often will quote, you know, this, this um, saying from Victor perceive first and then determine what is to be believed. And, you know, and, like anybody, Victor was a human, you know, he had his flaws. I heard some horror stories, you know, basically <laughs> around the campfire of some of the stuff that he would do hexing wise mm-hmm. and, and whatnot. Um, but he also was a very, um, I can say talented, magical individual. Um, I never met him, but I did have one phone call with him. It was probably about a couple hours on the phone. One day I just looked up his number on called 411 got his number because his <laughs> right. address was public. I had picked up Cora's book, 50 Years in the Fairy Tradition, and their home address was printed inside the book. And so Chaz said, well, why don't you give them a call? You know, oh, can I do that? You know, I was just so mm-hmm. like, it's like, well, if they didn't, if they didn't want anyone to call them, they wouldn't have put their address in the book. You know, okay. Right. So I called and I talked to him and he was pretty trippy. He told me things about myself that I had not told him. So he, he definitely had some magical talent there. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, you know, I often will, um, reminisce on some of his more famous quotes and that one to me is like at the core of fairy tradition, perceive first and then determine what is to be believed. So in this fairy is really approaching our religion as a type of science. It's a devotional science. Mm -hmm. You know, we are supposed to experiment and try different things. In fact, you know, we might think of the magic circle as, you know, our laboratory and we're all mad scientists, you know, in our <laughs> laboratory trying to figure this stuff out, right? To me, that's the point of fairy. That's also the point of what I would call traditional witchcraft. It's all about discerning the secrets of nature. Mm-hmm. You know, magic is just, you know, the secrets of nature that science has not revealed yet, you know, mm-hmm. to some degree. And um, so I think our job as witches, as warlocks, as magic users is to continue to experiment and try to find new and better ways you know, of connecting, of making this happen. Right. You know, so perceive first 
then determine what is to be believed. I, I think that's good advice. And also, you know, I think, um, I know I perceive tr- the traditions this way that, you know, there's the craft of witchcraft mm-hmm. and then there's the devotional aspects right. that you can either do or don't do, you know, and, 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 um, you know, there's some people that are like, Oh, atheist pagans. What is, what is that? And, you know, and I'm like, well, you know, there's a craft of witchcraft that doesn't require right a belief in a deity per se. I love atheist pagans. Oh, I love fabulous. atheist pagans. Um, well, they get in fewer arguments, first of all, and you know that's nice. <laughs> but um, what really actually bothers me the most are hard polytheists, and sometimes I feel like I am a hard polythe- polytheist. Sometimes it depends on my mood. Mm-hmm. It depends on on the day. Um, but atheist pagans, I, I, I think there's something really there because they don't get hung up on you know whose god is better or more authentic. <laughs> You know, I just recently saw somebody post something online that were like, oh, I'm going to have a problem with you if you're talking about using gods, you know, in a context or, you know, oh, I'm using Hakate in my, in my ritual for this purpose. And I'm thinking, who the hell are you? I mean, I, I like this person, you know, and I don't want to just, you know, jump on their character on this one little pl- post that they posted, mm-hmm. you know, but it really kind of it, it triggered something in me because it, it assumes that they have the right answers of the universe and everybody else is wrong. Mm-hmm. And so it's the same old flipping story right. you know, that we've had since the beginning of humans, you know, crawling out of their caves and, <laughs> you know, making organizations and trying to beat other people down. We've got it right. And you've got it wrong. I don't, I'm going to go on record. I don't know who the gods are. I work with them. I know them intimately, but mm-hmm. I could not tell you what their ultimate nature is in Blue Rose and um, in Black Rose, which is um, our school of the craft, my husband Chaz and I, our our partner Devin, have partnered up and we created um, Black Rose Witchcraft, which is sort of an introductory-ish school of witchcraft, Um, highly fairy influenced, influenced by Cult of Diana, Wicca, Sabbatic Craft, a whole bunch of different influences. I don't know, the the, the thing that really kind of gets me is that people want to assert their own belief system, you know, on, onto others. So when we have people saying, oh, well, you have to have this particular relationship. If you're going to work with Hakate, you have to do it this way because this is the way it was done back in, you know, Greece and blah, blah, blah. And, and well, that's all well and good. And I'm all for scholarship, you know, but in terms of like reconstructionist paganism, that doesn't really speak to me. Now I'm not going to say other people are doing it wrong because they're reconstructionists. If that's what speaks to you, that's what speaks to you. And to me, that's what it's about. You find what speaks to you and then you go with that. Right. But that's going to be different for all of us. Right. And it might be different depending on the stage of life. You know, there weren't, you know, I, you know, some people could be reconstructionist and that's going to really work for them. And then maybe they're going to turn around and something else or vice versa, Mm -hmm. you know, who knows? Maybe next year I'll be a reconstructionist. I doubt it. But, mm-hmm. you know, who, who knows what the, what the future will bring. But in Black Rose and in Blue Rose, what I really try to put forward is that we approach the gods as a mystery. Because we don't know the ultimate nature. I don't know what happens after we die. Mm-hmm. Anybody that tells you they know, they don't right. know. That, that's the thing that binds us together as human. Right. You know, we do not know. It's a mystery, capital M mystery. Now, yeah. I also find that if I'm approaching the gods as a mystery, that means I'm open to the fullest possibility. But mm-hmm. if I go in assuming with this belief system, this is what the gods are, I've limited my perspective. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm only looking in this narrow band. I'm only looking in this narrow range. And I could be missing everything else. So I think it's really important to recognize that we don't know what the hell we're talking about. <laughs> right. And we need to approach, you know, if we are even working with gods. And, and who knows? This is another thing. This is where I um, I'm at odds with some of um, Victor Anderson's stuff. Victor was very clear that the gods are not archetypes. Mm-hmm. And I actually don't see why they can't be. Now, here's something. I also think that in the pagan world, the word archetype gets misused. It's mm-hmm. most often used as a synonym for metaphor. And mm. archetype is not a metaphor. 
Those are right. two very different things. So I, I will assume that this is really what Victor was speaking to, that the, the gods are not just metaphors. You know, he really approached them mm-hmm. as they are absolute beings. They're separate from us in some way, you know, whatever. So more of a hard polytheist type type of stance. I'm not comfortable taking an absolute hard polyethist. 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 Ah. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's more of a both and approach, you know, and I have a similar yeah. approach to my dealings with spirit. And the other thing, I, you know, I was thinking while you were talking is that, you know, when we talk about spirits and deities, you know, I work with Hecate, and if you work with Hecate, we might have some of the thing. There, there, there's usually commonalities when people work with a particular, like a, a bunch of people work with a particular deity. They're, you're going to have some similarities, you know. With Hecate, you know, there's, you know, her as a death goddess, and her as, you know, the crossroads and making decisions and initiation. But, you know, those are kind of generalizations. Mm-hmm. The deities are going to come to each person differently. So, like, when Melek Taos comes to me, it's going to be very different than when Melek Taos comes to you, even if there's some similarities. And rightly so. Mm-hmm. And this is, this is the thing that I wish more people would um, get behind, is, is the realization that this is all relational. Yeah. You know, my relationship with the gods is not about defining the gods. It's simply about being in that moment, in, in that give and take moment, you know, when I am communing, you know, with them. That is, by design, going to be vastly different than if you connect, you know, with that same deity. You know, so obviously I, I'm, I consider myself a priest of the blue god. You know, so Melek Taos is definitely part of that within fairy tradition. Um, but if you came to me and said, oh, I had this experience with Melek Taos, and it's totally different, you know, than what my experience, you know, has been, instead of feeling threatened by that, I'm going to rejoice in the fact that this very diverse relationship, you know, is going on because it's beyond my scope. And to me, that's really what religion is about or spirituality is about. It's beyond the personal we're stepping into the transpersonal and that means to some degree all bets are off because you know you you are going to have your relationship and it's going to speak to you and your baggage and your right. strengths and all those things that I could have no clue about because we have very different life experiences and that's what it's about but i i often see people just arguing well that can't be right because this and i blah 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 no <laughs> this is not this is not this is not okay that, right. that we're using our religion now as weapons you know to yeah. to attack e- each other and I, I i probably naively thought you know in my in my youth that pag- paganism was the answer you know to that sort of you know using religion as a weapon we had seen the abrahamic traditions <laughs> and everything doing it right like we're doing the exact same thing we just don't have people in positions of power yeah. And so we can't really exert it to the same degree. But if you follow people's blog posts, you can tell we're just as messed up as anybody else in the world because we're all people. Well, and the other thing, too, is that, you know, paganism is coming into its own now. So, you know, we've gotten past the, you know, everybody work together for pagan rights. Wow. You know, and <laughs> not that there's not still some of that going on, but in general, you know, we've become for lack of a better word, again, <laughs> more mainstream, you know, we, it's, it's more out there, more accepted and, you That's know, true. by work, by the people before us and by people like us, right. You know, we, and it's a double edged sword. Uh, right. And now we're getting to the point where, okay, you know, we we're, we're out there, especially on the West coast for, you know, particularly on the West coast, because it's pretty are open here. Um, you know, so we've gotten past that initial let's everybody work together and be to get us more well known. Well, now we're more well known. So, okay. Oh, wait, what else do we have to argue about now? <laughs> you know, so, okay, let's, go, <laughs> let's, let's start arguing about theology differences in theology. And well, you know, in general, that's okay. And, you know, it does make for a lot of the same stuff that we critic, we as a pagan community criticize the major religions for. Mm-hmm. It's like, you see in the same similarities here. <laughs> kind of sobering, I think, when you first see that, you know, at least it was for me, 
to see we're, we're playing out the same pattern mm -hmm. that like these other religions have done. Have we learned nothing? You know, right. but then we see that again. I'm going to go back briefly to like the political climate you know, in the U.S. It's the same type of thing. I'm like, have we learned nothing since the 1930s? You know, we have a major presidential candidate who's talking about barring an entire religion, you know, from entering the country and tracking yeah. people. And like, have we not learned, you know? Um, so I don't know. I, you know, I, I feel a little jaded sometimes. Mm. And stuff like that, you know, because I feel like a lot of us have done a lot of work over the years to try to like raise the level of discourse and where, where has it gotten us, <laughs> you know? And yeah. so I, I have days where I'm just like, oh God, I understand the plight of Dr. Horrible, you know, who says <laughs> that, you know, oh, the right. world is just messed up and I need to rule it, you know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> if I oh, rule the world. <laughs> right. If I, if I were king. Yeah. And it it makes it hard, but I think at least for myself, it's like I'm trying to promote radical inclusion in my own ministry, and you know, even though it feels like p pushing water with a fork uphill, yeah, <laughs> a lot of the time, you know, it's 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 work worth doing, and yeah. I think you know, <laughs> I think as a community we should know better, but I also say to people, you know, it's like, yeah, as a community, we should know better, but we are still humans doing stupid human tricks. Right. Well, and also I think this brings up a good, this is kind of a good segue into talking about, um, just community. What, what is yeah. community? And, um, you know, I think that we talk about things like, you know, the fairy community or the pagan community. And those are more, those are communities in the academic sense. Mm -hmm, you know, at this mm -hmm. point, because they're too big, even like the fairy community, which we probably, uh, you know, there's no way to have an accurate tally, but we probably have about 300 initiates total. Um, there could, you know, give or take, um, right. I know a few years ago, there was a document that was going around amongst the initiates that was trying to track like all of them on a family tree. And at that point it was like 250. Now, there's people that aren't going to be on that list because, you know, some people are list phobic and don't want to show up, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, that's fine. But it's been several years. And, you know, I know I've initiated a few people, you know, since then. So maybe 300, maybe, maybe we'll say 350 just to, you know, add. But I, I can't imagine it'd be more than that. We're pretty small, you know, in terms of just the initiatory body. But even at that, even if we're only counting like 350 individuals, that's still a lot of people to try to rally around a, a singular idea mm -hmm. of which we don't even have a singular idea in fairy. I mean, honestly, yeah. <laughs> I've said this before, what we share all of the initiates is so infinitesimally small, literally what we all share throughout all the lines can fit on one side of a three by five index card. And I'm not exaggerating. Mm -hmm. It's very small. Like all the other material we find about, you know, fairy is just people, uh, exploring it and creating new material, which is our job. We're supposed to do that, right. but that doesn't mean that's part of the tradition for everyone. And this is why we have such a, a diverse um, way of working. You know, and I've seen the even time. very mixed, like, you know, it's fairy plus something else. Yeah. Right. And that's interesting to me too, because to me, fairy um, absorbs everything. Mm, mm -hmm. You know, and this this can take us into a, a, a scary little conversation um, about cultural appropriation, because we mm -hmm. have a lot of different cultural influences in fairy tradition. Most of that was because Victor claimed complete past life recall of these different lives in which he was a voodoo priest or he was a rabbi or he mm -hmm. was, you know, a Polynesian, a Polynesian kahuna, you know. Mm -hmm. And so he claimed all of those things. I'm not going to say that he was or wasn't because I don't know, you know, I right. can just imagine if I had full past life recall of these different cultural lives, then maybe I would step forward too and say, Oh yes, I'm this and that and the other, but I don't, I'll go on record. I do not have full past life right. recall. I've got snippets of things that I think might be a past life, but I don't mm -hmm. know, but I'm not going to make claims, you know, based, based on that. But Victor was a different person, you know, he, he, you know, so who knows, who knows? But what what I will say about cultural appropriation in fairy um, is that I don't see anybody in fairy 
going out there and saying, oh, well, I'm going to teach you voodoo because through my fairy work, I'm entitled, you know, to teach you voodoo or Huna. You know, it's another thing, you know, um, and there's a lot of Huna influences, one might say, you know, in fairy tradition, working with the three souls, you know, energy, mana. Um, but no one's out there saying, I'm going to teach you how to be a kahuna, you know? So to me, that's the difference. No one's appropriating a culture and, you know, but we could see maybe resonances. We can give props to these other cultures mm -hmm. that have this magical technology, the spiritual knowledge. Um, and to me, part of the craft is we need to learn as much as we can about magic from whatever source comes our way. And so I am going to, I do work with Arisha, by the way. I don't necessarily do that in my classes because I'm not really comfortable passing it on. Although I will give advice to people, hey, this is what I've done. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to claim that I'm part of an African traditional religion because I'm so not. Right. You know, but I do work with Arisha, at least on occasion, yeah. you know, and it, and it works for me. And I'm doing it in as respectful a way as possible, that it, at least coming from my point of view. Um, there are people who have told me straight up that to do so is disrespectful because I'm not an initiate of an ATR, African traditional religion. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to say, okay, that's your opinion. But that yeah. doesn't really need to affect what I'm doing, you know. Yeah. Um, so, and, and, you know, and I've had, I've had people in those traditions are like, you know, because basically I went – to a ritual and Yemaya Yama, Yama came to me and it's like, Hey, I can help you with some things. And I was just like, uh, okay. <laughs> and, you know, and you know, I'm, I'm not an initiate of the tradition. I will never claim to be. I mean, I have friends who are part of that mm -hmm. tradition. So I can go like, Hey, um, yeah, Yemaya Yama, Yama came to me and said this such and such and so and so, can you tell me about her? Right, right, right. <laughs> and, you know, I won't teach it in that sense, but I could say, Hey, Yemaya, I, this is what I've learned about Yemaya. And you know, if you want more information, I can hook you up. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Um, and to me, that's just the respectful way to do it. You know, we're not going to deny our own spiritual experiences because it doesn't fit in somebody else's box. Right. You know, and to me, what I found about whether it's Arisha or the watchers or, you know, what we call the infinitum, it, these beings seem to not care as much about the human boundaries, right. you know, that our traditions have put onto it. Now, I'm not going to say that that means that, oh, now it's a free for all. Everybody should go out there and just like, you know, work with all the Arisha everywhere, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. but if they are coming to you, then that's a different story. You know, if you're drawn mm -hmm. to them, that's a different story. You can have a relationship with them on your own. That's Okay. You don't have to be an initiate, you know, um, and people have said that even in fairy. Oh, you can't work with these gods. You can't work with Malik Taos. You can't work with Gianna Glass unless you're an initiate or you're a student of fairy. And to me, that's just ridiculous because that god in particular shows up to almost everybody. I, I've been yeah, taught right. classes that were not fairy based at all and had students come to me afterwards and say, during the trance, this strange naked blue guy showed up to them. <laughs> I was like, that was not part of this trance, you know, but it mm -hmm. was for them because the blue God wanted to work with them. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter that they weren't a student of fairy or they weren't an initiate of fairy. The blue God saw something in them mm -hmm. and went to them. Now, later, I will say in one of these instances, you know, that person did go on to be a student and is now an initiate of fairy because the blue God claimed them. But mm -hmm. that's kind of how it works. Spirit works on its own in, in its own way. You know, and we as humans get these organizations and our rules, and then we expect the universe to abide by those rules, and especially mm -hmm. in something like fairy. Fairy just kind of thumbs <laughs> its nose at, at those boundaries. It's, right. it's definitely the color that runs outside the line. You know, mm -hmm, if we mm -hmm. if we believe our own PR, we are an ecstatic tradition, you know, right. and a left hand path, which I think is a misnomer. I think we're a crooked path, actually. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but um you know, but if we actually believe those things, then we have to accept that somebody else is going to have a radically different experience than our own. Otherwise, we're still paying homage to, you know, what we might call a cookie cutter tradition. It must mm -hmm. all be the same way all the time. That's just not fairy. Yeah. And to me, that's not witchcraft. Yeah. You know, to me, traditional witchcraft, it is the, it, it breaks the rules. Mm -hmm. It's tantra to some degree. You know, it's about 
looking at what the culture says is taboo. And it doesn't mean necessarily doing that, but looking at, well, why is that taboo? Right. You know, some things are culturally taboo that we have no, there's no business for that to be taboo. You know, I'll give it one example, women breastfeeding in public. You know, some people think that that's totally taboo. <laughs> why the hell is that taboo? That this just makes no sense to me. Yeah. It's just human life. And, you know, or even like women being topless in public. I, I don't get that. You know, it's just right? like, well, men are allowed to be topless in public and nobody bats an eye. I mean, I guess you can't get a burger at McDonald's if you've got no shirt. But, you know, I, mean, right. I don't understand, you know, why. Oh, because we still have this really puritanical religious culture, you know, that is telling us, oh, you have to be in this certain box, mm -hmm. you know. Well, witchcraft is all about kicking down the sides of that box. Yeah. You know? I mean, and, th and that's another reason why I think that today... It's interesting. I think I find a lot of um, people who, you know, practice the craft, um, but are very invested in maintaining those boxes, you know, mm -hmm. and from my perspective, I'm like, well, you're coming from a very puritanical, I get why we're all, we, we all were raised in this society that tells us we have to be a certain way. But why, if you're practicing witchcraft, to some degree, or any type of radical spirituality, you know, it really is about questioning everything. You have mm -hmm. to question authority. You have to question your assumptions. Question what you believe to be true. Perceive first, then determine what is to be believed. Well, and, and, and you know, and as witches, you know, we talk about walking in between worlds. Well, if you're walking in between worlds, you're walking outside of those boxes. You're walking in between the lines of those boxes. In Absolutely. between the line of what, you know, perception. You know, you're, you're walking around those perceptions and like looking at them and being like, okay, you know, is this something that needs to be broken? Is this something that needs to stay the same? Is this something that needs to be changed? And a lot of witchcraft is, has that interesting uniqueness to it, to be able to look at these things and go, Hmm, yeah, no, you know, we need to change this. Okay, come on, let's do the mm -hmm. magic to get this done. Absolutely. I think it's important to remember, like you're talking about walking between the worlds and of course we do that outside of the craft too, as a gay man, you know, yeah. to some degree, I, you know, I walk, you know, between, you know, certain worlds, um, you know, it, it, I, th I think it's important to recognize that we have to stand outside of a particular paradigm in order to get a more full perspective, you know, a, 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 a deeper look, you know, at mm -hmm. what this whole paradigm is actually doing, you know, when you're wrapped up in it. You can't see it for what it is, you know, but if you are able to stand outside of it, even for a little while. And for me, that's why we need all types of people in this world, you know, because there are certain things I'm just not going to be able to see. You know, mm -hmm. I am a cis white man. Yeah, sure. I'm a gay man. It's that gives me some, you know, perspective outside of the mainstream. But I have other things that I'm going to be blind to, you know, yeah. um, and I work to be aware of where my blind spots are, you know, especially as a white male mm -hmm. in our society, I recognize that I have a certain level of privilege, you know, yep. that is invisible. And so I work to be aware of that um, so that I'm not exploiting that or just, you know, being dumb, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. you know, and right. Or utilizing your privilege to help others. Absolutely. My thing is I want everyone to have the same privilege. Right. You know, I, I want, I want everyone to be able to be raised up, you know, to the same, to the same level, but there are going to be things that I'm just not going to be able to see. And so I need other people to, to point that out to me, you know, um, with, you know, um, like certain people now, you know, talking about the trans experience, you know, within mm -hmm. paganism, you know, and that's been kind of a hot button issue. And, um, yep. <laughs> I will say that when I first, you know, like came into the craft, it's, it was not something I even thought of, you know, because I'm not a trans person and mm -hmm. I didn't know anybody who was trans. And so, you know, it made it very easy. Um, I, I will say, fortunately, I never really had any negative opinions, you know, but I think that it was easy to have opinions, um, that weren't based in anything real, you right. know? And, you know, it's the same thing I find with people that don't know any gay people. You know, mm -hmm. it's really easy for them to say how evil we are, or we do this, or we do that. You always hear Pat Robertson talking all about what we're doing, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so obsessed with gay sex, it's not even funny. He thinks about it much more than I do, and I've, I have two partners. <laughs> and, um, you know, but 
you know, so that's why I think it's, again, going back to visibility. I think it's really important. So right now, you know, there is kind of a battle, you know, going on um, with um, trans people, especially trans women, you mm-hmm. know, in, in the craft, because the craft is fairly female dominated. And, and, um, and I, I get that, you know, and I understand why this is one of the reasons that I was drawn to the craft, because it didn't represent the same old patriarchal male power over, you know, but then I have found, I will say, and this is not really a, um, a popular you know, opinion, but I have found kind of the opposite to some degree happening in, in paganism. Um, I've certainly been told by, um, some of my sisters in the craft that, you know, well, I'm not as valued, you know, as some others because, you know, I have a penis and, you know, they might not use that language, you know, but it's exactly what's, you know, being said, there is some misandry that happens in the craft, just as there's still misogyny that happens in the craft and obviously in the larger world. What I often will hear from people, though, is, oh, well, the pendulum has to swing the other way as if it's a justification. I'm going to oppress you because your kind has oppressed me for you know thousands of years. And so I'm going to oppress you now yeah. and that's going to make it all better. No, yeah. it doesn't make it all better. You know, what really makes it all better is true equality, like actually right. working together and recognizing we're all people mm-hmm. and we all are equal. You know, in terms of, that doesn't mean we're all equivalent. Everybody's got different skills, you know, whatever. Some people are better at some things than the other. But when it comes down to just inherent value, right. we're all people and we're all entitled to that level of respect. I would think that this is something that we should have learned by kindergarten. <laughs> and, um, I think we're still we're still as a culture trying to trying to learn that. Uh, yeah. And it, it 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 yeah, and I could go on about the whole misandry thing. I I I you do you do know that I have plenty of opinions on that, <laughs> um, considering the work I've done. Um, but unfortunately, as I know, we could probably talk a lot longer. But unfortunately, we are out of time. Oh, that just flew by. I know it's crazy. <laughs> Well, hopefully we can uh, talk some more and maybe talk about some different subjects in the future. Absolutely. I would love to thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. A lot of fun. So if people wanted to get in touch with you to talk about um, fairy tradition and other stuff and the topics that we raised here, um, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Well, if you want to learn about fairy tradition, my husband and I have a community resources website, and that is www.fairytrad.org. Um, you pretty much can spell that any way you want, but F E R I is the, the kind of the, the accepted spelling, even though I don't really care for that. That's a whole other discussion. Um, right. but you can find out more about me and the work that I do at fairywolf.com. That's F A E R Y W O L F.com. All right. Well, we'll put that in the show notes and, um, make sure that I have all the links there for that. And thank you so much for being on the show. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on. I'd like to thank Storm for joining us on This Week in Heresy. You can subscribe to This Week in Heresy via iTunes or the Stitcher app, or follow us on Twitter at TWIH Podcast. You can also financially support this podcast through Patreon.com. Thank you very much for listening, and if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave me a message at ThisWeekInHeresy.com.